to Menopause Morph, your time to change. We're here to help you thrive through your menopause, bringing you experts in many fields to help you from perimenopause to menopause and beyond to become the strong, vibrant woman nature intended you to be. Hosted by Pauline McCarthy of the Pearls of Pauline. Pearls of wisdom, compassion, and joy. Welcome to this week's episode of Menopause Morph. Today we have a wonderful speaker, Dr. John Moran. Dr. John Moran has started his professional life as a dental officer on the aircraft carrier HMS Centaur before studying medicine at St. George's Hospital, London, England. He has a diploma in family planning and worked in several family planning clinics in London, England. He started the Menopause Clinic at Mary Stokes, London in 1980, working part-time there for 17 years. In the past, he has been the medical director at the Hormone Healthcare Centre, working with Dr. Malcolm Carruthers in menopause and andropause treatment. He is presently medical director of the Holistic Medical Clinic, with special interest in treating female menopause with bioidentical hormones and phytoestrogens, male andropause, sexual dysfunction and chronic inflammatory disease. He has a whole lot more of it in his history, so to find out more about Dr. John, please go to www holisticmedical.co.uk. So welcome, Dr. John. Thank you for coming to talk to us here on Menopause Morph. Thank you. So I was very impressed with your history here, 1980. Today, even menopause is like a taboo subject. People don't like to talk about it. So I can't imagine what it was like in 1980. (laughs) It was even worse. And I wasn't interested until I was asked by Mari Stokes if I'd start a menopause clinic. And I said, yes, I would, as long as I had some training, which I did have at King's College in London, which then was very much the centre of menopause research in the UK. Yes. So that's really amazing. So since you've got all this wonderful knowledge about how to manage the menopause, could you give our listeners and myself, what's the best thing to do to manage the menopause? Well, first of all, you want to see a doctor who knows something about it and hopefully one that can listen to you. And then there are a variety of things that you can do. For instance, only um, well, a small proportion of women have no symptoms of the menopause, so quite often the best thing to do is perhaps nothing for them. And then you've got various options like phytoestrogens, which are very weak estrogens, which relieve some of the symptoms and have other benefits. And then you've got natural progesterone, which very much helps with mood, but not with so much with hot flushes. And then you've got, of course, HRT, or what I think is better, bioidentical. Could you tell us about bioidentical hormones? A lot of people, they don't really know what it is. Okay. Bioidentical hormones are hormones that are exactly the same as your own hormones in your own body. And they're made by plants, which are normally yam or phytoestrogen, or or phytoestrogen, so soya, which are then converted to exactly the same as your own body. So you will get exactly the same estrogen, exactly the same progesterone, exactly the same testosterone or DHEA, chemically that is, as you have in your own body. The difference between that and, say, synthetic HRT is that they are made pharmacologically and particularly progestogens, which were the initial ones that oppose estrogens, are very much synthetic and have adverse reactions in terms of PMS-like symptoms. There is a natural progesterone now that has been produced by a pharmaceutical company, thank goodness, which is chemically the same as your own progesterone. But by and large, um, by identical hormones, we tailor make them for the individual woman, and so that we can vary the dose of whatever we're giving, um, which sometimes takes time to get the right dose for the individual person. Okay, and what you were saying earlier about find a doctor who knows something about the menopause, because Mm -hmm. a lot of my listeners often go to their GP and the the GP knows almost nothing about menopause. Uh So in different countries, there are different attitudes towards doctors. Myself, I was raised in the UK and it's almost like there, it's like the doctor is God, you know, and you must obey what the doctor says. But I think after having lived in Iceland for 22 years, I've learned that, you know, the doctor is a human being and maybe he doesn't know everything. So I think we have to encourage our listeners that if they're not happy with the doctor to find another doctor and not just to say, oh, this is my family doctor I've had all my life. So I have to go with his word or her word. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, a lot of my patients come from looking at my website. Others are referred by other doctors, by other healthcare workers, by psychotherapists, etc. 
um, because hopefully I listen to patients. That's because I did three or four years training in counseling years ago, uh, which is revolutionary to me, because in, in medicine you tend to be a bit dictatorial, you, you used to be in the past. Whereas now I think if you can listen, you learn a huge amount from your patients. And I like to work with my patients. So if they have a problem, I want them to ring my practice immediately so we can talk to them about what the problem is, i.e. if what I've given them isn't successful. Well, that's excellent. So I'm sure that many ladies listening to this will be giving you a call. And those who don't live anywhere near London, perhaps they can look at your website. Do you have a list of <coughs> doctors that you could recommend in other parts of the UK? Oh, yes. There are, for instance, I belong to the British Menopause Society and have done for 22 years or more. And they have a very good conference for two days every year. So all, most of those doctors tend to be either gynecologists or family planning doctors, but quite a lot of nurses also deal with the menopause. And there are quite a lot of GPs in that audience that are properly trained, as I am, in treating the menopause. So if you find your GP isn't very sympathetic, then you can look online, certainly for doctors that treat uh, bioidenticals or HRT, and it just happens that I prefer bioidenticals. Another name that's often banded about now by gynecologists is body identical or men's, which is exactly, exactly the same thing. Okay, okay. And what is the difference between managing, you know, the word menopause is kind of um, stretched out, let's say. Technically, it means the one year after your last period. Yes. And women tend to, in general, they talk about menopause as perimenopause or premenopause, the whole gamut of symptoms for it can range from three to 15 years. Yep. So if we talk specifically about perimenopause, the part, you know, leading into menopause itself, what kind of way would people manage that? Is it a different way to manage perimenopause than actual menopause itself? No, that's a very good question, Pauline, because I think a lot of women perhaps assume and say to some doctors that unless your periods have stopped, then you can't be in the menopause. Although that's strictly right, you do get menopause symptoms before your period stop, i.e. in the perimenopause. And that might be two or three years at least before you actually stop your periods. So if you've got, for instance, the worst symptoms like uh, night sweats, hot flight, so you can't sleep, uh, sleep properly, or mood changes, etc., it might well be the perimenopause. So to answer your question, how do I manage that, I always take blood tests to find out what the levels of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, mm -hmm. and 17 beta estradiol, which is estrogen. If your estrogen is raised to normal levels and you're still having symptoms of the menopause, then you shouldn't really treat with estrogen because then you will have too much estrogen because you're still ovulating. So that's what I tend to use phytoestrogens that are very weak estrogens. And they're isoflavones and again derived from soya. They're chemically almost very similar to your own body estrogen. They only reduce bad symptoms by about 50%, but that's a huge improvement on not improving them at all. Yeah. And quite often I will give natural progesterone um, with them. Again, after I've measured progesterone, actually normally I do that for women that are cycling, i.e. still having periods, in a month-long saliva test that looks at every three days what your estrogen and progesterone levels are and your testosterone. And then I can gauge whether you are deficient in progesterone rather than just guessing. So in those cases, I will give progesterone because progesterone increases a hormone called GABA, which is a great mood karma, almost a natural antidepressant, as well as a diuretic. So I, I very much like progesterone, but a lot of women I found tend to prescribe for themselves over the net, which I think, I wouldn't say it's dangerous, but it's not necessarily the most helpful thing they could do. You could also just give phytoestrogens by themselves, which I often do, in the right dose, that is. And that will, as I said, reduce symptoms. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of products in the pharmacy that you can buy. Mm -hmm. And would you recommend people to use any of these products? There's very little proven research that, apart perhaps from black cohosh as a herb, and that certainly reduces hot flushes, but then there are dangers of using any herbs without being monitored correctly by a practitioner. Now, it could well be a naturopathic doctor or nutritionist who can prescribe those. I think to prescribe them for yourself, I wouldn't say it's dangerous, but you could be getting into trouble. And I've seen a lot of women who've done that for two or three years, some with success, some with no success at all, and they made themselves worse. So I, th I think you'll be better advised to go to a uh, professional, not necessarily a doctor, if you want to use an alternative approach. But the scientific evidence and data for the success of those products is very, very limited indeed. 
Whereas with fighting estrogens, HRT, bioidentical hormones, the evidence is very good. Yes. In, in my experience, when I was having symptoms, I went to the pharmacy and huh? I just asked, you know, do you have something for the hot flashes? And they said, oh, yes, we have this and this and this. And I said, well, what did they do? And it was just a young girl. She had no idea. You know, I don't know, but people are buying them, you know. <laughs> so. Well, yes. I mean, I, um, 12 years ago, did my postgraduate master's in nutritional medicine rather than nutrition. And I wrote my dissertation or thesis on the use of phytoestrogens in the menopause, comparing with HRT. And that's why I know a little bit about phytoestrogens in comparison with just, you know, going in and taking a product, not knowing what it does. Yeah. I think they're pretty safe, though. In fact, I think on my website, I said there are over a thousand women's studies on phytoestrogens in terms of safety. And they're beneficial for breast health. They don't seem to affect the lining of your womb. So, And there's nothing else you have to take with them. So for the perimenopause, it's really quite a good option. And what about minerals and vitamins? Is there any specific minerals and vitamins that ladies going through the menopause should be focusing to take? That's all. It's far better to eat well and the right sort of food, because this is one of the main problems of putting weight on, for instance, is that, as we all know, if you eat too many refined carbohydrates and eat too much, then you're probably going to put on weight. And at the time of the menopause, you particularly are inclined to put on weight because sometimes you have a slightly underactive thyroid gland, sometimes it's difficult to prove with tests, but your metabolism slows down. So as far as vitamins and minerals, to answer your question, a really good all-round vitamin and mineral is useful, but I don't think it'll make any difference to your menopause symptoms. Okay. One corollary for that, sorry, is if you're on HRT, there is good evidence that you can deplete in various vitamins and minerals. So if you're not eating the right diet and you're not digesting and absorbing food, that's the important thing. You might well need a good all-round vitamin and mineral. And there are huge, I can talk about that for ages if you want me to, but um, I won't. (laughs) Maybe we'll have you on again another time and talk about that. (laughs) But you mentioned there about putting on weight. I'd like to ask you about women's body image. Of course, we hear a lot that menopausal women put on some weight and they also suffer with sometimes a little bit depression or self-esteem problems. So can you talk a little bit about women's body image, weight gain, and generally a woman's place in society in the Western world at post-menopause? Okay, I think, I think with body image, it's a question I always ask, you know, how do you feel about your body image? Because some women are concerned about their facial looks, and that might be because collagen, particularly post-menopause, if they're not taking any estrogens, will decline quite rapidly. And loss of collagen is one of the causes of lines and wrinkles, etc. And that's a different subject, but there's a huge amount you can do about that. It's not just a question of using Botox or fillers. You can use all sorts of things from the proper practitioners to increase collagen in your face. So estrogen does that, but that's one of the things that women will complain to me about. They don't like their face because it's starting to sag. The more major problem is weight gain. And that's where I think it's so important to gain to lifestyle exercise and nutrition because that can make a difference. I remember when I first um, read the book 5-2 Diet, for instance, I was quite impressed with the author because it does work. I try to do it. Two days a week, you cut your calorie intake to, if you're a lady, about 500 calories a day, which is quite tough, but you will find you will lose one to two pounds on those days if you do that. That combined with exercise will help you know, control yourself from not putting on weight, and you should lose weight. The other common reason is, I mentioned earlier, an underactive thyroid gland, and and that will slow down your metabolism and therefore put on weight. So simple things like measuring your body temperature as soon as you wake up in the morning, that body temperature will be lower than your normal temperature if you've got an underactive thyroid gland. Um, You could have other signs like your cholesterol might be higher, you might start losing hair, you might have your eyebrows might get a little bit thinner on the outside, and various other things, lethargy, depression you mentioned. So all these things play a part in how you feel. If you've got all the horrible menopause symptoms, it's not surprising you don't feel okay. Now, one of the things I haven't talked about is testosterone, which can also fall post-menopause anyhow, or even before the menopause. Testosterone or lack of can make you feel depressed, can make you feel completely lacking in energy and sex drive as well. So if you measure those things, which I always do, in the blood, then you can try and rebalance them. I mean, the weight gain around around your tummy is a difficult 
thing to do. And though there are more drastic measures, you know, like liposuction, etc., I, I think it's far better to start off with trying to increase your exercise regime, change your diet, and look at all the things that can, you know, sit-ups and all that sort of things. Um, they, they can all help. And if they fail, then you want to go to somebody who is an expert on reducing fat around your tummy. And there are ultrasound machines that do this now, which... So, so there are ways of doing it, but it's a common problem for anybody past the age of 50, man or woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to put the camera up anyway on podcast. People won't see me anyway, <laughs> which is a good thing. You look fine, <laughs> Pauline. Stop worrying. Um, well, this is one of the things I don't know if I've told you. I do a stage show. It's called The Pearls of Pauline, and it's pearls of wisdom, compassion, and joy for menopausal women. And in it, you know, I have my glittery dresses, my feather boa, and I'm singing some Shirley Bassey and Frank Sinatra, and it giving some inspirational talks to the women and saying that, you know, no matter, you know, what your shape or your size, you can have fun. You know, <laughs> it's it's all in your mind. You know, it's like you look in the mirror and um, I learned this from Louise Hay. She talks about mirror work and she said, many times we talk to our friends and we say, oh, that's a lovely dress. Oh, you're looking great today. But we never give ourselves compliments. So she said, every day, go to the mirror. It's like when you're, you know, you're brushing your teeth or doing your hair, say, oh, hello, darling, how are you? Oh, you look great today. <laughs> give yourself a boost. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You know, you can also ask your husband or your partner for a compliment. I know my wife sometimes, when I don't give her a compliment, says, don't you think I've got nice legs? And I'll say, yes, you have, darling. I'm... Sorry, I haven't uh, mentioned it before. That sort of thing. But I think giving yourself a positive stroke is important yourself. You know, when I was a little boy up at school in North Berwick, when I used to go to sleep I was away from school, I would try and remember what I'd done that was good during the day, and I'd go to sleep with that thought. And I think that's so important to give yourself something positive. Otherwise, you can drag yourself down. Talking about women in the postmenopause, the book I read a long time ago, written by Gail Sheehy, who was quite a famous author, I think from New York in the early 90s, is so positive about life after menopause. And it's a book I really recommend every woman should read. It's called The Silent Passage. The Silent Passage. And that was, that was published a long time ago, but it's really positive about women's attitude to themselves at the time and after the menopause. And I first met her in about 1992 when she was at that stage in her life. And I think she just got remarried. And I found that book an inspiration because it wasn't about the medical side of the menopause. It was about you in society as a woman. If you look at Eastern society, they value women much more post-menopause as part of the sort of tribal hierarchy, if you like. And I think we should be doing the same. We probably are beginning to here in the Western world because we have far more women politicians now, thank goodness. We have certainly in the medical profession probably more women than men now, whereas in my time when I trained, it was very much the opposite. So I think the post-menopause ought to be a time of celebration. Yes, as you were saying, like I, I've lived in many Asian countries myself, and the attitude towards women, especially older women, is like the matriarch is the most yes. respected person in the family. Whereas Western society is, uh, you know, I'm very sad, saddened now. I was brought up, you know, with this Irish grandparents and you know, they were always with us when we were growing up. And it was a very, like three generation family all in, you know, yeah. always together. But yeah. nowadays the tendency is like, oh, put the old people in the in the old people's home, you know, like, oh, I don't want to be looking after them. I, I think, I'm not saying that menopausal women are old, old people, you know, but post-menopause, I think we have to learn so we can learn so much from the wisdom that these ladies have accumulated and hopefully in the next five ten years i'll have much more wisdom <laughs> so uh, what's your take on that well i couldn't agree more i always think back to my late aunt who lived on the west coast of ireland who um, wasn't medical but her sons and she had quite a few of them built in their village which is called Malrani, um a center for people who were older or incapacitated and they had their own little sort of day center and their own little sort of hospital where they could recover from things and she would go around there as a non-medic she knew everybody by name and who they were and she used to take you on a sort of ward around there and I thought what a wonderful idea and I think that particular village won some sort of ward as one of the best villages for that reason and so there no matter what age you were whether you were very young because I think certainly the older I get and I've got six grandchildren the more you want to spend time with them um, and so the young and old need to mix together, as well as, if you like, the middle age, which includes, of course, menopause. And think on, after menopause, you should have a good 
30 to 40 years at least to live. So you've got, you know, not half of your life to live, for God's sake. So you need to celebrate and change. You shouldn't have to worry about having too many children, because hopefully that'll be important, then at least half the menopause proper. <laughs> And there's no reason why you shouldn't continue to enjoy life to the full, if not more so. And certainly my aunt was a one, for example, I think. I think she died about two or three weeks after winning the golf championship, age 84, you know. Good so, <laughs> and so, yes. so um, talking about enjoying life, and many women, they have a part of life which should be very enjoyable. They find mm-hmm. not so enjoyable as they go through their menopause, and that is sex. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you hear this often that, you know, women go off menopause. No, no, they, they don't go off menopause. They go off sex. They probably go off menopause as well, yes. <laughs> Um, and is there a medical reason behind this? So, uh, often people say, yes. oh, it's just my age, it's just my age. But is there a medical reason about it and for it? And is there anything they can do to reverse it? Yes, there's a huge amount you can do. It is something that you shouldn't be concerned about. Although I think you need to bring it to the attention of the practitioner that you see. From my point of view, one of the main causes that women will suffer is a dry vagina. And what happens if you take no replacement estrogen um, or testosterone for that matter, um, the lining of the vagina becomes very thin. And that's why intercourse becomes painful. And therefore, that will put anybody off sex, for goodness sake. So that is so easy reversed by using topical either estrogens or estrogens with testosterone or even testosterone in recent research by Professor Susan Davis from Australia, who's a professor of endocrinology, who was advocating testosterone in the vagina. So you can, anywhere on the NHS in the UK, ask your GP to prescribe an Eastern preparation for a dry vagina. If you look at the Cochrane Review, which was, a, I think, published well over 10 years ago, which looked at whether women who were given HRT ever still had a problem with the dry vagina, the answer was that 25% of women still did. And so they will need topical treatment. So if you don't want to take HRT or bioidentical hormones, in, in, if you saw me, for instance, you can just ask for topical treatment in that area, which is easy to do, 14 nights to make sure the thin vagina gets thickened, and then just maybe once a week you have to use it. So that will sort out the problem of discomfort. But even just as important, estrogen often, if it's lacking, will cause bladder problems, like getting up at night to have to go to the loo, like more frequently during the day. And that's reversed again by topical estrogen. So that side is easily resolved. Moving on to my favorite topic, testosterone, quite a lot of women will have very low testosterone postmenopausally. And if you replace testosterone, at least in my experience, about 80% of women will have an increased sex drive because they're, they're taking testosterone, as I say, a cream, not necessarily in the genital area, but rubbed on the arm to give them systemic testosterone. And this will give them more energy and more sex drive. So that helps. But 20% at least of women, if not more, have other reasons for going off sex. Like they might have a poor relationship, or their partner might have a problem with their sexual performance, um, or they might be depressed. And often testosterone helps to reverse depression because it, it gives you that more energy and get up and go that you lack. So it's not just about replacing estrogen and progesterone. It's sometimes about also giving some testosterone or even DHEA, which is an adrenal hormone, which in postmenopause women converts to testosterone. So there's an awful lot you can do. And I think probably having said all that, the best thing to do is to talk to your partner. You know, a lot of couples that I see, they're frightened, not frightened. They don't want to talk about it because they're either embarrassed or they've been married for so long they just don't talk. And I think you know, the communication side is absolutely vital. So I prefer to see if that's a problem, the couple, and then I can talk to both of them, or they can interrupt and say that's not true and so on. So you can get a dialogue going and communication going. Yes. I, think that's, answer something. I think that's very important that many couples are embarrassed to talk about yes. women's troubles. Yes, or sexual problems. Yeah. Sexual problems, yes. And um, if they came to a doctor or a psychologist or even mm. a friend who's willing to be a mediator, mm. yes. to give yes. them a chance to talk about it, because many times in life, we just presume that the other person knows. <laughs> and then when we actually get around to talking about it, we find out that the person had no idea that this was going on. Absolutely. Um, um, and, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a medical expert at all. I, I studied medical science many years ago. I worked in a laboratory. That's a long, long time ago. But, you know, through just experiencing menopause myself, I've 
picked up a few things. And some years ago, a friend of mine, an English lady, <laughs> she was mm. very embarrassed. And she said to me, oh, you know, I haven't had sex for three years. And I said, why mm. not? And she, and she says, oh, well, because it's painful. Um, but I've just told my husband, oh, we're too old for that. You know, and I said, and then I didn't know about what you've been telling us now about the testosterone and the estrogen, topical estrogen. So, but I knew about KY jelly. So I said yeah. to her, why don't you use KY jelly? And she said, what's that? And I said, I'll buy you some. You know, so I came and I brought, gave her the KY jelly. And a few days later, she phoned me up and she said, I think you've saved my marriage. <laughs> well, well done. I think you have. You know, there's, a, there's another wonderful product called Sensel, which I have nothing to do with, but they've often presented a stand at the British Menopause Society. And that is a completely natural lubricant that either comes in a water-based or an oil-based um, sort of sachet or little bottle. And that alone helps, as you just described, KY jelly doing, but it's better than KY jelly, in my opinion. There are a lot of products around that will help. But if you get to the reason, and that's why I practice medicine, and I try and think of why something's happening, the reason is that you've got very little east and left in the vagina, and it's very thin and dry, and that needs to be reversed by what we just talked about. But if you don't want to go down that route, you've got, as you've just said, either KY jelly or Sensel or a lot of other products that are vagina lubricants. So oh, that's really amazing. There's one question that just popped into mind. If we go back again to, we were talking sure. about the estrogens. Uh, there's a friend of mine, she has a breast cancer and she's mm-hmm. very scared to take uh, anything with estrogen in it. But can you explain, is the topical estrogen in the vagina, would that affect the breast cancer? That's a very, very good question. It's one that I've come across quite a few times because I do see ladies. I do come across a few ladies who come to see me who've had breast cancer treated, and they come to see me to know what can they do about being intimate with their partner because they've got such a sore, dry vagina. Now, if you don't want to use, or you're being, being told not to by your oncologist or your breast surgeon, then you can use KY jelly or Sensel or similar product. But if you use Estriol, which is the weakest of the estrogens, It's what's called a beta agonist, which means that it actually probably protects the breast against breast cancer. But I would never prescribe that without talking to the patient's breast surgeon or to their oncologist. And now quite a few of them are quite happy for the patient to use that particular estrogen, which is a very weak estrogen. And after two weeks of using it, hardly any gets absorbed at all. So you'd only be at risk, if you are at risk at all, for that two-week period. So I think it depends how aggressive the breast cancer was. And quite honestly, I think any person like myself needs to at least communicate with the oncologist or breast surgeon. One case stands out for me where the breast surgeon was a lady. And she said, I have no objection at all to describing that estriol, which is a very weak one, which I could call ovestin, because I can't see the danger. Not all women have um, estrogen positive breast cancers, but I can understand the fear. And it's very real. But if you don't want to take that risk, you can use, as you rightly said, KY jelly or another lubricant like Sensel, which will get over most of that problem. Okay. And Does that help? Is there a difference between the vaginal dryness? Will that continue for your life? Would people have to take this, uh, either the KY jelly or the estriol or other things that you mentioned, would they have to take that for the rest of their life? Probably. But one of my gurus who sadly died some time ago was a consultant psychiatrist in New York called Helen Kaplan, who most of her books were sort of standard reading for me. And she was saying in a really good relationship, postmenopausally, if it's a good relationship, often you don't always get that vaginal dryness. You still lubricate normally and you don't have discomfort. But if you did, if you started to use the Sensel or the KY jelly, you might well find if you're patient for the initial part of penetration, in fact, that it, it isn't uncomfortable. So I think the answer to your question is probably, yes, you will have to use it for the rest of your life. But using something once a week is not a great trial. No. no. So So, So there's no reason not to be completely free and happy with your sexual life. And um, you can seek help for it. I, I mean, I really feel very strongly about this. There's no reason why any woman should have to have discomfort during intercourse if it is purely due to being postmenopausal. Yes. Well, thank you for that. So we're coming near the end of our time. Is there any last words you would like to tell our listeners? Yes, I think the menopause should be a a time for celebration, not for being doomy and gloomy, although you might well, when you first go into it, feel depressed and down and miserable, and you can get help. 
and there's a huge amount we can do about it. And if you use either HRT or bioidentical hormones in the first five years of the menopause, you're going to prevent an awful lot of potential diseases like osteoporosis, osteopenia, heart problems, maybe even dementia. So you can get help and you should ask for help. And you haven't always got to use a pharmaceutical preparation. Wonderful. So thank you very much for coming and giving us all your information and hopefully we'll have you on again another time. <laughs> My pleasure, Pauline. Thank you very okay, much. Indeed. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks for listening to Menopause Morph, your time to change. If you've enjoyed the program, be sure to subscribe to the next one and please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help us spread the message about thriving through the menopause. To get a free ebook, more menopausal resources, and to connect with Pauline, please visit www.menopausemorph.com.